Hello and welcome to this second Mask Trade Talk. I'm delighted to have with me uh, Bruce Jones uh, today as a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute, an independent think tank based in Washington, D.C. Bruce is also a non-resident fellow at the Yale uh, University. Uh, Bruce is not only a, a desk jockey, as we might uh, call him, but uh, he has experience from uh, diplomacy on the front line and, uh, and real politic experience. He was part of the UN mission to Kosovo, served as a special UN assistant to the Middle East process, and was advisor to the US State Department and the World Bank on fragile states. Bruce's latest book, To Rule the Waves, and the topic of our conversation today uh, examines how economics, geopolitics, and climate change are playing out across our world's oceans. Before opening the questions uh, with Bruce and the discussion, uh, I just want to remind everyone on the call to please post any questions or comments in the chat box and we'll try and incorporate them into the conversation. With that, uh, welcome Bruce uh, to Mask Trade Talk. Thank you for having me. Bruce, thanks for making the time uh, today. I know you're busy uh, speaking to many in the US around your book, book and your, your insights from it. Um, but what I'd like to do uh, today is to start with uh, kind of how we got here, a little bit sort of looking back at the role of the oceans. Um, for those of us who are close to global trade, we see every day in our, in our working life the role that oceans have played and do play in, in, in modern commerce. Um, but that's an outcome. It's an outcome of a long and complex history of nation states, economic heft, and uh, a naval power. Can you just get us started with setting the scene around um, how oceans have shaped uh, the world we experience today? I mean, it's really striking to look back and to see that for the past 500 years, no state, no nation, no empire has risen to the heights of world power without fielding the world's dominant navy. Um, the, 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 the process of establishing dominant power on the, on the oceans has been the central dynamic of empire building and imperial competition and now modern uh, geopolitical competition. That started um, 500 years ago, literally at this moment of a historical accident when China, which had the most sophisticated maritime fleet in the world at the time, chose for, for reasons that had nothing to do with the rest of the world to pull back from the seas precisely at the moment when the Portuguese found the long uh, trade routes around the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean and Europe entered Asia's waters. And for the succeeding five centuries, Europe has been able to dominate international politics, uh, Europe and the United States following uh, by dint of maintaining the world's most powerful navy. And when you look at modern globalization, it's really shaped by the way in which Europe's navies push themselves into Asia, uh, establishing trade routes from India and later China uh, across then the Suez and into Europe and, and eventually the United States. Yeah, th 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 thanks Bruce. So, and, and then when I sort of think about the rise of Europe and the US, I'm struck by one of the quotes you have in your book and it's actually from uh, Xi Jinping uh, when he says that countries that embrace the sea thrive and states that spurn the sea decline. Uh, with, with that in mind, um, what role has the rise of, of Europe and, and the US in that sort of more modern era uh, what role have oceans played in that uh, in that rise of those of those regions? Yeah, there again, it's very striking. I was looking back. I was looking at some maps of global trade, and there's a fantastic map that the CIA produced of global trade in the 1950s. And it's essentially these two large flows uh, from South America up into the United States and from Africa up into Europe. And sort of very minor flows across that. All that changed with the creation of containerized shipping, and you start to see. Um, uh, from the late 1950s, the 1960s, 1970s, this huge growth of trade across the Atlantic, connecting the two industrial centers of the day uh, and global uh, economic growth and global trade growth and global shipping size moves on a precise uh, parallel. Later, of course, the Asian tigers get into the story, partly created by the logistics bridge, a sea logistics bridge uh, created by the U.S. Army. Um, fighting the Korean and the Vietnamese wars, and, and sea-based trade becomes the dominant source of global economic activity in the ensuing period, eventually, of course, pulling in China. 
Yeah. So in that sort of sweep of, of history from ancient history to modern history, you might say that you know the oceans have been um, supporting and facilitating global commerce, uh, exchange of ideas, thoughts, uh, and innovation. Um, but the sort of question arises, at least in my head, sort of where does that leave us today? We're at sort of a um, perhaps a, a tipping point with with attitudes changing uh, globally. Um, and you use sort of another image in the book that kind of struck me around um, oceans once being. Uh, the boundary of our existence, particularly in, in ancient times as we were exploring across vast oceans, to now being the front lines of rivalries that will shape um, the, the 21st century. And, and I think that sort of captures very well perhaps the, the turning point or tipping point we're at. And you suggest rivalries um, will play out across four dimensions um, of the oceans. And that's, uh, that's uh, globalization, uh, geopolitics, data and communication infrastructure, and of course, the existential threat we're facing currently of climate change. Um, I mean, these are all deep topics by themselves, but could you just sort of walk us through each of those and how you see them playing out and, and the role that the oceans will play in determining the outcome? Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's very striking in, in globalization. It's 85% of all global trade moves by sea. When you look at energy flows, it's 80% of gas and 60% of natural gas, uh, sort of oil and 60% of natural gas is either found at sea or moves by sea to its final destination. 93% of all data moves on undersea cables that line the ocean floors. Globalization is fundamentally a phenomenon of the oceans. Uh, the challenge, and by the way, uh, so is climate change. Um, in the industrial age, 90% of all the excess heat produced by the burning of, of fossil fuels has been absorbed by the oceans. They are the great carbon sink, but that chemistry is starting to change and that dynamic is starting to break down. There was a period of time, I think, when we might have hoped that because countries like China and the United States, as well as the Europeans and Indians and others, are all exposed to globalization, are all exposed to climate change, we would see that driving cooperative framework or response but that's not what we're seeing what we're seeing is a breaking down of cooperation and we're seeing rivalry sort of flow through up each of those each of those domains the the argument i make in the book is that it is contrary to the conventional wisdom that globalization uh, links us it's actually been the opposite it's been the most important driver of the tensions between us essentially because china reached a point where it was not comfortable with the notion that the U.S. Navy plays the dominant role in protecting the free flow of trade, and the free flow of energy, freedom of navigation, protecting the sea lanes of communication. It felt deeply uncomfortable with that and began to develop its own naval power, returning to the seas for the first time in 500 years. And that huge geopolitical fact of China's re return to the seas has begun to drive this very uh, intense naval arms race between the United States and China which is pulling everybody else in, uh, centered on the Western Pacific, but not limited to it. And that dynamic of tension is even there in places like the Arctic, where the warming uh, or the melting of the sea ice and the cooling of the waters is producing huge new commercial and energy opportunity, but also a very rapid militarization uh, of the Arctic. Uh, if I just sort of dig into a few of those a little bit, I mean, on the globalization story, I think you know, it's generally accepted that trade and globalization have certainly grown uh, wealth and grown the pie. But you touch on your book, as we did with Danny in the last talk, around this issue of distribution of wealth and, and so on in, in the U.S. Could you just give us your sort of perception of that and, and kind of, you know, I know you're not an economist, but nonetheless sort of foreign policy and, and yeah. political political observer with a good insight on this. What, how, how has that manifest itself in also some of the foreign policy thinking? Um, that, that you've just alluded to. Yeah, I think it's been, it's a kind of central dynamic now because you have 10 or 12 major hubs of sea-based trade and finance. Those two things always go hand in hand, um, which are the absolute beating part of the U.S. economy. And, and to a very large extent, um, don't focus on it, but there's a phenomenon called financialization of the U.S. economy. Uh, of all of the profits recorded by U.S. corporations, 50% of the profits uh, recorded in the U.S. economy are in the financial sector. That's about be having become the financier of global trade 
uh, and investment in, in the new global economy. It's extremely localized around those few major financial and trade hubs. Um, those sectors and those parts of the country have gained a lot of jobs and a lot of profit and a lot of wealth. And of course, uh, other parts of the country, especially in the interior, have been deindustrialized, have lost jobs. The job gains have been much larger than the job losses, but politically it's it's very different and, and it has contributed to a sense of a fractured, uh, a fractured country where coastal elites linked into global commerce, linked into global finance, uh, profit from globalization and the center of the country does not. That's obviously oversimplified, but that is the political reality that we're dealing with. And it produces a phenomenon where the elites uh, understand the importance of the United States maintaining globalization, maintaining a large Navy and all of that. But there's a huge loss of support for that in the in the core of the country, the kind of Trump movement and et cetera. Um, and so there's now a, a very deep debate in this country about whether or not the United States should maintain the role that it played as the kind of leader of the international system, as a provider of global public goods, and in particular on this, this kind of very important role of the U.S. Navy in guaranteeing freedom of navigation and freedom of trade. Yeah. And then that kind of leads neatly into this second area you, you sort of highlight of, of the sort of geopolitical um, uh, conflict or tensions that are coming, as you say, and sort of you highlight this as the most important zone of the confrontation. And, and you highlight a few things. I think one is the kind of question around, as you just mentioned, the role of the U.S. Navy in protecting global trade and sort of who pays for that and who benefits. There's a disconnect. Um, obviously, the, the, the rise of China and others, if you were also mentioned. And then I think also, you know, the rules of the game uh, anchored as they have been in the WTO. How do you see, you know, the future of, 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 of the, the role of the U.S. Navy in, in guaranteeing sort of rites of passage, U.S. engagement with the WTO, and then, you know, at the rise of others um, in, 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 in both economic heft and, and how that will impact um, the the uh, trade and, and the U.S. approach to guaranteeing uh, the passage of the high seas. I, I wonder how long it's going to be that the United States decides that it's wise to shoulder the very substantial cost of guaranteeing the flow of trade and energy goods into its biggest rival. Uh, that's a very unusual, <laughs> an unusual situation historically. Um, of course, it's an interlinked economy, so it's not as straightforward as that. Um, first point, I'm glad you said, and others, because of course, although the United States and China get all the attention, there are the Russians, there are the Indians, there are the Japanese, there are the Europeans. All of these actors are playing at the game of trying to either protect or reshape globalization, and all of them are entering this naval arms race uh, with submarine fleets, with surface fleets, with technology, we've seen the U.S.-Australia-U.K. submarine deal. There's a Japan-U.K. Uh, U.S. submarine deal or naval deal. There's all sorts of activity. India, particularly important in terms of the the pace at which it's investing in its naval infrastructure in the Bay of Bengal and the and the and the Andaman Seas, um, kind of constraining China uh, uh, as it moves into the Indian Ocean. Um, so there's a lot a, a lot of players at stake. Um, it's unpredictable where the United States is going to be, which is part of the challenge. There is a, a substantial body of opinion in the United States now that we should be walking away from the WTO, walking away from these from these uh, roles that we have played. On the other hand, there is a kind of mounting uh, sense of concern about China's growing influence, and that's a kind of counterbalancing force. It's pushing uh, a dynamic of confrontation and a rivalry. I, I think we can count on serious and sustained tension between the United States and China uh, past the point of simply competitiveness and dipping into rivalry, not yet fully into conflict, but getting awfully close. Um, last point, I think what we will see, what we're starting to see is at least at the elite level, not yet at the consumer level, but a real interest in remaking uh, globalization, remaking supply chains to become less reliant on China uh, for critical goods. Uh, a huge factor here is the extent to which India does or doesn't genuinely open itself to globalization. Um, uh, you will, your audience will know if you're if you're uh, in the trade business, India looms far, far smaller than it should relative to population size. There's huge growth potential there, and there's huge potential there. 
uh, to remake uh, global supply chains, but, but that is uncertain as of yet. That in my mind is probably the single biggest factor in determining whether we end up in a world where there's a fundamental clash between globalization and geopolitics, or if we sail into a world of sort of two different but overlapping globalizations. Let me just pause here, Bruce, and just remind uh, the audience that if you have any questions or comments, please do uh, post them in, in the chat, and I'll be happy to, uh, to, to uh, pose them to, to Bruce. Uh, Bruce, let me just pick up on this last point around resilience and think about supply chain. I mean, it's the hot topic in, um, in, in, in international trade at the moment. We were just discussing before coming on that you've been trying to send your book to me for several months now, and it's still not arrived. I think it's a very good uh, example of the challenges. Um, but is it really possible to sort of decouple or disconnect um, from, you know, uh, the global supply chain, be that based in Europe, China or wherever? We've had decades now of deepening of supply chains, of interlinkages, slicing up of manufacturing. Um, I understand that, you know, there is a very systematic process going on in the US by commerce and others to understand all the linkages they have and to really start identifying um, where they're exposed on a strategic level. Um, where do you think that's going, Bruce? I mean, what, what, how can this, can this expand to a broader set of products or is this still kind of the high walls, small yards type policy of targeting specific sectors and specific uh, goods and products? What's, what's, your, what's your perspective on this? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it, one of the things that's very striking to me is the difference between what's happening inside key institutions like commerce and the NSC and DOD on the one hand versus American consum consumers who are voting with their buy now button on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> so a huge expansion of consumer spending. Nobody cares where the stuff comes from. Nobody cares where it's made in China or wherever else. Um, leads to two scenarios. Um, one is worse than the other. The, the better scenario is that there is a relatively careful, uh, thought through effort. It must involve a new low cost supplier, most likely India, possibly parts of Africa, but I think more likely India, remaking quite important parts of the supply chain. It would be drastically, inevitably to pull away from globalization altogether, but you could remake important parts of the supply chain if new suppliers come on stream. My worry is that that doesn't happen, that U.S. consumer spending and consumer attitudes keep pushing us to ever deeper globalization. Yet at the same time, global tensions are rising, geopolitical tensions are rising, and naval tensions are rising. And those two things could come into very sharp and very expensive and very complicated uh, contradiction very soon. The, the sort of third area that we were sort of touching on, highlighting where you see uh, the oceans playing a role is in uh, data and communications, and you particularly zoom in on undersea cables. And there's a question just come in around the role of artificial intelligence and data for um, you know, making supply chains more uh, resilient, agile, and so on. Um, but I think we forget kind of the, the physical infrastructure that's needed to actually enable all of that data and so on, uh, and, and, and the tools on top, AI and, and what have you. Um, can, can you just, I found this a bit fascinating actually, Bruce, and it was something that I was uh, not fully aware of. Can you just walk us through the kind of um, reliance we have on these undersea cables and the vulnerabilities um, yeah. that they pose um, to the functioning of you know, our daily uh, 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 commerce and our daily lives? Yeah, I just wrote a new piece where I described them as the most important and most vulnerable uh, links in all of globalization. Um, it, it was astonishing to me. I, I was, of course, aware of undersea cables. I thought about it as, you know, a relatively small part of our world. Uh, everything we do, this meeting, uh, when you go on online banking, uh, if you're using your cell phone, if you're posting the Instagram, if you're in the Danish military or the U.S. military and you're sending instructions, all of that, every part of that relies vastly on the flow of these cables, several hundred of them now, that line the ocean floor. 93% of all data in the world flows through those cables. Satellites play a role, but it's trivial uh, by comparison to the undersea links. I discovered, Graham, uh, one of these little historical side notes. 
that it was actually my great, 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 great grand uncle uh, who laid the first undersea cable aboard the HMS Agamemnon back in the day. Uh, but ever since then, that has been a growing part of our economy, a growing part of our society, a growing part of our technology, of our military apparatus, uh, and they're highly vulnerable. Um, there are several countries who can disrupt them. They can be tapped, broken, uh, hacked, uh, and I think we are, we have done much too little to uh, build our resilience in those, in those cables. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I was I was uh, astonished at the at the numbers around uh, the data flow through 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 those cables, particularly given our uh, dependence as, as modern societies on on those data flows. The Bruce, the fourth area you highlight, and this one, you know, is 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 of course very topical, but it's it's climate change and the role that oceans play in that. Um, it, there's some. Uh, perhaps complex, but there's some there's some important chemistry involved here for sure. Can you walk us through a little bit kind of, you know, what what the role of oceans have been as a sort of an absorber of, yeah. of the carbon and then the potential for them to be an accelerant uh, yeah. of, of the tipping point as we go forward? Yeah, you know, so as I mentioned earlier, and it's interesting, by the way, a lot of what we know about climate change comes out of studies conducted by or supported by the U.S. Navy. Uh, in the 1940s and 1950s, planning for World War II, fighting World War II, and then planning for a nuclear war. Um, and the oceanographic sciences that the Navy develops in the 50s and the 60s really lay the data foundation and the chemical foundation of our understanding of the role that the oceans play in interacting with the atmosphere. So that as we are burning fossil fuels, uh, what one of the oceanographers in the 1950s calls his grand historical experiment, of burning, taking fossil fuels out of the ground, now also out of the ocean, uh, and burning them into the atmosphere. For a long time, we've been focused on the atmospheric effects. What we have learned is that the oceans have been absorbing the excess heat and the carbon, 90% uh, of all the excess heat produced by the burning of fossil fuels in the last five decades has been absorbed by the oceans. But as it does that, it's changing the chemistry of the oceans. Uh, the chemical effect is it absorbs that excess carbon. Uh, the oceans are warming, and those are changing currents and changing patterns. Ultimately, those two things are going to come together in a change in the Mer meridional overturning circulation current, which will dramatically change weather patterns. That That's out over 100 years or, or longer. But even well before that, uh, the intensification of the melt of the Arctic sea ice and even more worrying uh, of the Antarctic ice sheet um, may produce pretty substantial changes in sea levels and, and in warming patterns, which contribute to um, storm surges, etc. And that combination of sea level rise and storm surges is going to become, it has already become extremely disruptive. And there's good enough science now to be able to track this pretty carefully. I talk in the book about us, some studies that have been done to look at the way that it's played out in the Bay of Bengal already. Uh, it's just devastating effects uh, for populations and, and coastal areas. Some of this is natural phenomenon, but we are accelerating it. And of course, we now have several, uh, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of people who live along coastlines, uh, unlike was true the last time we had these kinds of patterns. And so the, the potential disruption is very substantial. Uh, and we're going to start living that now. Whatever we do with climate policy, we're going to be dealing with that adaptation now. Yeah. No, a very, very, very poignant, very uh, uh, sort of something to reflect on, I think, as we sort of ponder the next 10, 20, 30 years, um, certainly uh, from the climate change angle, uh, but also from the others uh, that we just talked about. And, and, and with that, as we kind of move to thinking about sort of what's coming at us, so we kind of laid the groundwork here of kind of these uh, areas of, of challenge. And we sort of start to put that together and think about, okay, what's coming at us? Um, you, you sort of say we're, we're approaching a tipping point uh, and an end of sort of relative calm, as, as, as I think you put it. Can you kind of speak to some of the concrete challenges that certainly companies and, and, and citizens can, can expect to face uh, going forward? And... Do the oceans actually become less relevant for trade and commerce uh, for all the reasons we've just mentioned, or do they retain their their key their key role? So here I'm thinking about you know there's the 
there's the melting of the ice that you mentioned previously, opening up of the Arctic North Sea uh, Passage, which gives opportunity and threats. Um, there's the impact on differential impact on communities, as you mentioned, across countries and sectors. C can you speak to that a little bit and kind of when we drill down in this of what's coming at us, just to give us a sense of some of the, the concrete elements that um, we might be facing and having to deal with both as companies and as citizens? Yeah, I like to say to colleagues and friends here, if you think the supply chain problems are bad now, wait till we're fighting a naval war with China in the Taiwan Strait, right? I mean, it's just, look, uh, several, several things here. Uh, first of all, I do think we can start uh, recognizing the likelihood, not the possibility, the likelihood that we will be in a continuing situation of intense uh, naval tension verging into potential conflict in the East China Sea, the Taiwan Strait, South China Sea, Singapore Strait, Western Western Philippine Sea, Eastern Philippine Sea, Western Pacific writ large. 50% of world trade moves through those waters and they're increasingly militarized and increasingly tense. We have to start thinking through the implications of that. Um, one way to read this book, though, when you when you look at the historical moments, whether it's the Suez crisis, the second Suez crisis, the Korean War, one way to read this book is as a story of global shipping finding their way around geopolitical constraints uh, and the innovation that has happened, uh, which has driven trade, the innovation that allowed for the creation of new supply lines, the innovation that allowed to bring Asia into globalization. All of this is driven by global shipping companies, including very importantly, Maris, by the way. Um, and so that innovative spirit, not taking the constraint as a, as a hard constraint, but as a spur to, to innovation, I think it's important to retain that, to retain that spirit. Um, if I were in your shoes, I'd be doing three things. Uh, I'd be investing in the oceanographic sciences. We need to understand even more than we do now where ocean level rise and storm surges and that interplay is going to play out and how it's going to play out and where it's going to affect ports and shipping lanes, etc. I'd be finding deep investors and long-term investors in India who have the potential to, in a major way, remake supply chains. Uh, they need a ports infrastructure. They have not got that. That's going to have to come. Um, I would put a long play into India uh, on its entry, its deeper entry into globalize, globalization that creates all sorts of opportunities for trade that aren't entangled in the Western Pacific. And I would be actively planning for a scenario, a near-term scenario of active warfare between the U.S. Navy, the Chinese Navy, and others uh, in the Taiwan Strait and in the Western Pacific writ large, and what that's going to mean for, for supply chain movements and, and routes. Um, th those are a lot of things, but they are all present in front of us. When, the, when I end the book, I try to make the case that these are not future challenges. These challenges are here right now. Uh, they are in front of us, and we need to have a serious conversation, a sober conversation about the scale of those challenges and what it's going to take to to navigate to navigate through them. Yeah. And, and what does that conversation look like? If you think about it from a U.S. perspective, um, what are the things that need to be realized around the, the position of the U.S. in the world economy today uh, and, and what its um, levers are and how it needs to navigate? But also from, from the other side, I mean, you know, the U.S. is an important economy with a lot of heft, but there are other economies that are um, growing and have, uh, you know, their own uh, uh, rights and desires and, and ways of thinking about the world. Um, what on the U.S. side do they need to sort of realize and think about? When you think about other players, what do they need to reflect on and realize in order for us to get to hopefully a point of, uh, I think you quote Margaret Thatcher uh, in the book of sort of statesmanship um, to uh, uh, of a rare order, I think, as she said, in order to avoid the scenario you just outlined and to actually get us to a more cooperative, collaborative, uh, sort of, if you will, win-win situation rather than lose-lose. What, what's, what's needed on all sides here to kind of realize um, the path we might be on and uh, the, 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 the place in the world? Yeah, I, I would be satisfied with something well short of win-win. I'd be satisfied with simple crisis avoidance at this stage. Um, even even that we're not seeing. Uh, although I will give um, President Biden credit that the 
He made repeated efforts to reach out to Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping eventually responded, and we had that virtual summit a couple of weeks ago in which the two leaders committed themselves to investing in uh, the diplomatic guardrails against escalation and against conflict. That's a, that's a good start. Um, look, when I, I confess that when I think of a serious sober conversation, I do not think of the U.S. political system, but to the extent that the U.S. system is capable of it, it to my mind, it is a conversation between the United States, uh, key European partners, Japan and India, hopefully, about how the quad is an important expression of that, we can go farther than that. How those centers of gravity, political and economic and military centers of gravity, can collaborate towards a, uh, a managed remaking of globalization that reduces this intense vulnerability that we have right now uh, and avoids this extraordinarily uh, expensive and, and complicated clash that could come if we end up, as, as, as I'm concerned we will, in a situation of militarized tensions precisely in the waters where 50% of the world trade flows are, uh, we need uh, to avoid that, to avoid that outcome. I think we have to start having very serious conversations with our publics about the cost of what it will take to remake globalization. You're not going to be able to get your flat screen TV from Amazon by now, deliver the next day necessarily. You know, we might have to accept two day delivery, God forbid. Uh, you know, if, if we want to live in a more stable world, we have, we have to pay a price for that. That's an incredibly hard conversation to have in a democracy. But yeah. unless we start having that conversation, start socializing people to it, we risk this much more disruptive uh, scenario. But I, I do think it's not just a U.S. conversation. It's a U.S., Europe, Japan, uh, and as I said, hopefully India conversation about about cooperation, about supply chains, about naval competition, um, without leading us to actual conflict, which will be quite devastating. Let's hope that we can navigate towards that. Um, Bruce, we, we started late, so I'm going to just ask if we can stay on for five minutes uh, past the original uh, end time, five to 10 minutes. And yeah. I would just like to sort of pivot a little bit toward, we've talked a lot a, little, a lot about sort of Asia and, and that um, uh, uh, side of the world and, and the relation with the US, but you also mentioned at the, at the start, uh, Russia, and we haven't really touched on Europe and its position in all of this and it's um it's it's striving for what it calls strategic autonomy in this uh evolving dynamic can you sort of speak a little bit to to, to the russia angle and and then how you uh, maybe a few words on, on europe and how you see uh, europe sort of um playing in this in, in these waters yeah you know, um, the Biden administration, when it took office, said that what it really wanted out of Russia was calm, a kind of calm, quiet relationship. I, I do not think that Mr. Putin is going to deliver that for President Biden. Um, uh, he, Russia has a great amount to lose in all of this. It has a great amount to lose in a uh, move away from fossil fuels. It has a great amount to lose in uh, the remaking of globalization. And it, it's only playing in a kind of serious way in the military side of the equation, very disruptive. And, and it has some important assets there. It's rebuilt its armament capability. It's rebuilt its weapons manufacturing and sales capability. Its Navy is nowhere near as large as it was in the Soviet era, but it's very sophisticated. The submarine fleet is very sophisticated. And what we're watching is pretty intense cooperation between the Chinese and the Russian fleets. Um, and that amplifies China's breach. So that, that Russia piece worries me. Um, I, I do think Russia will prove to be a very disruptive actor for quite some time. But for Europe, I think the notion of strategic autonomy, you know, there's a huge debate around it, and the Germans don't agree with the French and the British, etc. But at core, I think what is you, the kind of major European leaders are trying to say is that they don't want to live in a world where they are squeezed uh, and forced to choose between the United States and China. That's also the refrain out of East Asia, don't make us choose. But the reality is that the driving dynamics in Beijing and the driving dynamics in Washington are different than that. And I think people are increasingly going to be forced to choose. And that's partly about Chinese behavior. It's partly about American behavior, partly about the natural dynamics of these, of these things. 
Uh, but I think we will see increasingly clear sort of battle lines, so to speak, and Europe will have to decide where it where it fits. Uh, obviously, in an incredibly difficult situation, you look at Europe. I mean, look at Germany and its largest market for cars is China, not the United States. Um, uh, and yet, China is behaving in ways in Europe that's deeply problematic from uh, standards and human rights and norms and legal point of view. So I think Europe is going to have to have some tough introspective questions amongst itself. That doesn't mean that it has to kind of fall in line with the United States on its China strategy. Um, but it does seem to me that there's an awful lot for Europe to lose if it isn't willing to put some muscle and some money into pushing back against the Russians and push back against the Chinese in, in certain spheres of, of behavior. Yeah. So Bruce, on, on that, sort of just extending that, there's a question here from one of the, uh, one of the participants on how the global supply chain could be impacted from on the North Pole um, because of the Arctic el ice melt and the sort of right. <laughs> the, the military maneuvering that's going on there in one way or another to control the North Sea Passage. How, how what can, can you elaborate? I mean, again, you have some very good insights on kind of what's going on there and the game that's being played in, in, in that part of the world. Can, can you speak to that a little bit and, and how you yeah. see that dynamic playing out? Yeah, it was, you know, I start the book, I, I went to this um, an amazing place called Olasvern in northern Norway, and it's this giant cave inside a mountain, which actually turns out to be a submarine base. It's like being on a James Bond studio. It uh, <laughs> was actually NATO's northernmost outpost during the Cold War. Post-Cold War, sold into private hands, recreational facility, training facility, etc. Uh, in the last three years, of course, rapidly rehabilitated as a naval base and the U.S. has signed a status of forces agreement and there are American nuclear submarines back in the Arctic, uh, keeping a very close eye on the Russians and a very close eye on the Chinese. Uh, from a Chinese perspective, if that, you know, at the point in time, which we estimate is within a kind of 20, 25 year time frame, if the melting of the sea ice uh, is enough to allow for year round commercial passage through those waters, it cuts in half the time to send goods from Shanghai to New York or, 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 uh, or Hanover or London, etc. It's as dramatic a change as the opening of the Suez Canal was in the 1850s. It would dramatically remake the cost structure uh, uh, and the time structure of global supply chains. So that's very consequential if we are still in the same world of globalization that we are in now, where the supply of, of goods from China into the United States and Europe is the kind of central uh, central part of the flow. I, I'm not so convinced we will be. Uh, you know, I think we may well be in a, in a slightly different globalization or two globalizations, one U.S. and Europe centered, and one China centered. Uh, at which point, the Suez—I mean, the kind of the new Suez, the, the Arctic, the Northwest Passage—may be somewhat less consequential. But for now, it's a kind of huge looming uh, factor. And in the shorter term, of course, it's also a massive boon in terms of fishing and energy exploration. The largest uh, natural gas find in the world in the last couple of years was in the Yamal Peninsula in the Barents Sea, just south of the Arctic, and this huge Russian stakes and in getting the gas out of those waters and huge Chinese stakes and having that gas shipped down to them by, uh, by pipelines and by sea. Um, we've seen a massive new investment in science. Some of it is dual use. Uh, and, and that's a place, by the way, where Europe also is starting to play an important role. I closed the book in the Arctic as well with a major new scientific exploration in the Arctic led by Germany, uh, the first major oceanographic exploration not led by the United States uh, since the end of the Second World War. Uh, Europe has a, a very important role to play in, in the science space and in the commercial space. Uh, but increasingly also we're seeing Europe put some assets into the military uh, dimension of, of the Arctic as well. And I fear that the Arctic is becoming a, a very tense flashpoint once again. We are almost out of time, unfortunately, and as one of the commentators said here, that it would be great to continue for another hour. So many topics and so many interesting elements to this. Unfortunately, we are almost out of time. Um, just before we let you go, Bruce, uh, it would be really good if you could just repeat these three sort of takeaways you mentioned earlier. Um, for, for, for companies who are thinking about, you know, this navigating in this 
environment going forward of course they have to process many things but what sort of what are the three highlights for you that should be top of their list as they think about navigating their business through this yeah. uh, through this environment and by the way if they'd like to dive deeper on the topics there they're more than welcome to buy the book at amazon.com and somehow <laughs> or another it will get to them in <laughs> some supply chain or another <laughs> um to my mind there are there are there are three um uh, it's the oceanographic sciences, actually understanding what's going on, sea level rise, ocean warming, changing current patterns. A lot of that research comes out of navies and, and, and the kind of scientific establishment, but the shipping community could contribute to that in very important ways. Uh, and obviously is a huge consumer of that, of that science in the end. That would be one. Second would be uh, sort of long play investments in Indian port and infrastructure development. I think the pressures will start to grow and the opportunities will start to grow for India to genuinely open globalization, enter globalization uh, to, to a degree that it hasn't done so far and replace uh, some parts of China's contribution to the supply chain, but it needs a ports infrastructure, it needs a shipping infrastructure that it doesn't have. It's building its naval infrastructure, but I think there are real commercial opportunities there as well. And then the last more sober point is to be engaged in intensive planning for the possible and in my mind quite likely scenario that in the most important shipping routes that Maersk and Ariel sails from Singapore to Shanghai uh, that you will have to find a way around those those waters because we could be embroiled in very intense military uh, posturing but even tipping into active conflict in the south and east China seas and the Taiwan Strait. Thanks very much, Bruce. Uh, I think we have to leave it there. And uh, thank you so much for being willing to take the time and sharing, you know, these insights that you have. And I know you have extraordinary depth on these topics. So, so thank you for, you know, sharing some of that that knowledge with us today. And thank you to all the participants. Um, and we hope to see you at the next uh, trade talk in the new year. Again, Bruce, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And I couldn't have done this book without being on a Maersk ship and engaging with you as a company. So my, my huge thanks to you for that and, and especially you, Grant. Our pleasure. Thanks, Bruce. Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye.